So whether it's lunchtime for you over on the East Coast or you're just getting your day started on the West Coast, we're super glad that you are here. Um, as I said before, we're joining you from New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, Ariel is in one part of town. I'm in another part of town as we're working in our remote offices, as I'm sure many of you are as well. Uh, throughout this time of being home, we've really enjoyed hosting so many webinars. And, you know, as we've been living our lives virtually, this has been a really great way for us to connect with so many different people. And we're actually approaching our seventh, our 10th webinar since the start of quarantine. And so this month we decided to make our content all about one of our favorite industries, which is education. So we at Search Influence have clients across several industries, which is a really big benefit for our clients because of the fact that we get to be exposed to best practices um, in multiple industries, as opposed to being so focused on just one. We find that we are able to see a lot of different things that work in different industries and then try them out for others. Um, but so we really have found a niche in education, uh, particularly in higher ed with some continuing education focus where we've had some really great successes over the last few years that have really led up to us shaping up this session for you today. So I'm Paula French speaking and joining me today is my co-presenter Ariel Tusa. And beyond our work with our clients, Ariel and I both really love spreading digital marketing insights with the world. Before COVID, that meant a lot of around the town speaking and even a little bit of uh, speaking when traveling. And so to give you just a little bit of background on the perspectives that Ariel and I bring to bear, we're going to share just a tiny bit about our roles and our backgrounds. So I am currently responsible for high level strategy for new clients for search influence, uh, marketing of search influence as an agency, and assuring that our services are ready to achieve the goals of our clients by developing our, our products and services. So I've been with the company for 10 years, seven of which I spent on the account management team working with select, working directly with clients of all sizes and in all industries. Ariel? Hello, good morning. Uh, I have been with Search Influence since 2015. I focus on our large marquee accounts, especially in the industries of tourism and education. Since we started our relationship with the Tulane School of Professional Advancement in 2017, I have been responsible for their strategy and the optimization of their marketing campaigns, both digital and traditional marketing. Thank you, Ariel. So now just for a little bit of background on Search Influence, uh, we are a nationally recognized full service marketing and consulting agency. Um, and we you know, have a lot of great accolades over the years in our almost 15 years that we've been around, hence all of these great logos that you'll see on the slide at the bottom. And as I mentioned before, we do have clients across uh, many major industries that we have particular success in education, tourism, and medical. So when we were founded in 2006, uh, we were founded as a search engine optimization company, which is really a huge benefit for us as an agency and for our clients, because at our core, we're very technical and we're very data focused. And we found that this comes in particularly um, in handy in the education industry, where we're working with lots of different tools and software systems and having to connect them so that we can have a really seamless experience for prospective students and then students well, you know once they make that uh that choice to register today we're going to cover a few reasons why educational institutions have a leg up in digital marketing we're going to talk about marketing budget cuts while in a recession and then we're going to dive into our top seven tactics um, each of which we're going to have examples for so that you can visualize and of course, we'll wrap up with some high level takeaways and some Q&A. So feel free to input any questions you have into either the chat or the Q&A feature of Zoom throughout and we will answer them at the end. So there are a few th unique things that educational institutions have going for them. And these are really in light of and in despite of the pandemic that I wanted to share today. So an early study regarding conversions during the early days of shutdown showed major dips across several industries. And this is taking a look at conversion. So on-site website conversions, that could be an action such as filling out a form or making a purchase, whatever that conversion is that, you know, which is unique to that individual website. So only a few industries saw growth and a few saw a very small decline. 
among that group with that very small decline was education. And so this was really great news to us as education marketers. And our data continued to support this study past the time that it was conducted throughout, you know, throughout the shutdown with inquiries remaining strong. And even in some cases, we had some record breaking months, which was, of course, really exciting to see. Google Trends also positively supports the supposition that the interest in education remains strong. This is evidence, especially when looking at the interest in online learning, online courses, and degrees, as you can see in this chart here. So interestingly, online degrees, the searches for that, which is the yellow bar, remain pretty consistent, which I was kind of surprised to see that, and I'm interested to see if that's going to go up as we head into the fall. Um, but it didn't have the same amount of growth as the other two search terms showcased here. So you'll see online learning and online courses saw significant increases in interest over time as measured by Google searches. So you can see this nice big uh, spike right around the time when the COVID-19 shutdown begins. And then the third benefit that I want to call out for educational institutions is the trust that Google confers on both your brand and on .edu domains. And so this really is not COVID specific at all, but this is something that we always like to highlight when we're working with um, educational institutions because of the fact that these are two things that you have going for you when you're talking about your search engine marketing and even other marketing as well. So when it comes to ranking on Google, meaning being prominently placed at the top of search results when people are looking for the programs that you have or the information that you have on your sites, both your brand and your .edu domain give you more credibility in Google's eyes than other websites are going to have. And so Google knows how many times you're mentioned online, Google knows how many other websites are linking back to you, and both of these things are quantitative signals to Google that you are an established brand. And established brands, time and time again, are going to rank more highly in Google search results because Google wants to show trusted information to their users, and the brand that a business portrays is one of the things that Google sees as a signal of trust. Moreover, Google also trusts you when you have a .edu website because they're not available just to anybody, only to you know, the most elite institutions. And so when you have a .edu website, Google is going to trust you a little bit more. So these are great things that are gonna benefit you in particularly once you spend the time to make sure that you have a great experience on your website so that you can increase the number of visitors to your website through search engines. And so one of the first uh, top tactics that we're going to talk about is content for your website. And so when you have this foundation of this great brand and this foundation of this .edu domain, doing all of these things we're going to talk about today are really going to uh, add those additional layers to the fact, um, to Google's trust and to your relevance to come up in those search results. Next, I want to build a little case for something we've been hearing and seeing. So throughout this time, budgets are being cut, budgets are under review, budgets are under scrutiny. We hear it time and time again. And so we know that you know as a marketer that your budget needs to be protected so that you can invest in building the pipeline of candidates for the future of the school. We also know that marketing is often looked at as a discretionary line item that can be cut. And so if this feels all too familiar, we feel you. I'll give you a second to look at that. So let's review two stats that may come in handy as you're thinking about your marketing budget moving forward. So the first is a study that was produced by Kantar, who is a global media company. Um, they produced a ton of research throughout COVID about consumer behavior and about marketing. Uh, so they ran a theoretical test on an unnamed but real beer brand, and they modeled out what would happen with sales and market share if their ad spend was slashed. So this study found that if the brand cut all of its ad spend during the crisis, this would have a 13% impact on sales in the long run, not just in the short run, but in the long run, and make it hard for them to recover their market share. However, just a 50% reduction in ad spend would result in just a 1% drop in sales. So it's a pretty big difference in cutting all of your ad spend versus cutting just half of your ad spend and the impact it can have on your short, short and long-term success. So Kantar's global head of media shared an impactful insight. Brand health becomes vulnerable when companies stop advertising. And if they do this for longer than six months, it destroys both short and long-term health. So moving on to our second stat. So while unprecedented might be the word of the year, we do have the Great Recession of 2008 to draw upon for insights when it comes to marketing impact. 
So studies have shown that during the Great Recession, brands who continued to advertise recovered nine times faster than those who didn't. So there are several examples out there, Hyundai and Del Monte Foods being two of them, that saw significant gains after upping the ante with their marketing in 08 or 09. So while others were pulling back, they went all in and it really paid off big time for them. So when every project or perhaps simply every meeting feels like this, it can really be challenging to know where to go next. And so we're really hoping that today, as we share some of the insights from what we've seen work, um, that you can, that'll really give you a plan with which you can proceed confidently. So now I'm going to turn it over to Ariel to talk about how we're going to start driving prospects. So now it's time to dive into the fun stuff and uh, like Paula said, start driving prospects into and then down the marketing funnel. So all marketing tactics need to be carefully thought about in relation to the funnel. Uh, and you can see an example of this on the screen. You may know this as the marketing funnel and we use this graphic to depict more than just the strategies and the tactics we're going to deploy for our clients and their strategies. We use it to illustrate the research and the decision making process of a prospective student. A distilled version of the marketing funnel covers brand awareness, consideration and decision phases as you can see. But this can be extended to include things like retention or a delight phase. We find it helpful to think about the, uh, the difference in these two sides of the different funnels. So the marketing funnel is the model of your marketing and sales process from the organization or the university's point of view. We look at it from a student's perspective or point of view. The student's journey is a map of the route a customer or student takes from the time they first encounter your brand or your university, whether that's online or um, in person when, you know, in person events and things come back into play. Um, so all the way from the beginning through the time they enroll as a student. And as I mentioned before, in terms of uh, retention or delight, it can extend into their time as an alumni um, and which they would become um, hopefully a brand ambassador. So uh, as I mentioned, we find when we look at it from the student's perspective, it opens our eyes to the types of content we need to produce and the places we need to be present. Here is a sample student's journey, which has the channels on the left by which we would reach them and then the journey and their different behavior on the right. This one is built for a hypothetical executive education class for aspiring CFOs. When creating the student journey, uh, you should start by taking notes about the prospective student behavior. There are three main things that you should consider when mapping out your phases and the behaviors there. So first, what content are they consuming and what sites or sources are they visiting? So for example, in the brand awareness phase, they might be reading articles on creating dynamic projections for organizations in growth mode. Next, what phrases or questions are they searching for? In the consideration phase, someone might be searching for terms like executive education or entrepreneurship program. And then what actions are they taking on your site? Uh, you may also wanna consider what actions are they taking off site but on your site and the, the pieces that you can own and control, they might be filling out forms to collect more information or starting the application process. Once the prospective student behavior has been captured for each phase of the journey, the next step is to decide what channels and what tactics will, be, will best reach prospects in each of those individual moments. You'll see some channels on the left are repeated. Uh, what differs is how they are applied. So getting into some more specifics on content, let's talk about how to optimize your website for prospective students so that they can find the information that they're looking for quickly and prompt them to take action. So this is the current degree page for a client. It looks pretty good overall. It has nice design, has good use of their tagline, it has call to actions at the top of the page. So at first glance, you might say, all right, this is pretty good. Well, yeah, it is pretty good, but we want to take it to the next level. But before we do that, I'm gonna show you a screen recording of the full page. Okay, so let's just start scrolling in just a second. 
All right, so as we look at the full page, it's got a lot of really great information on it that prospects want and that prospects need to make the decision. We've got mission, vision, and history. We have program competencies. So what are the things that you can do with your degree after you've achieved it? Degree requirements. Coursework faculty, and ultimately FAQ or frequently asked questions. And then we get down to the bottom. So this is a nice information rich page. We're working with them to make some optimizations to that. And so this is a mock up that isn't even live on the site yet. And so at the top of the page, we updated those calls to action. So yes, apply now and the virtual tour, which prior were in the header, are two very important steps that we want people to take. However, a general inquiry or even a program specific inquiry is the is most often the first step in the process. And so we've made that much more prominent so that we can get those people into the funnel, right? So the goal is to get them into the funnel and then we'll move them down the funnel. And so we're gonna move them through the funnel to take a virtual tour and then to apply now using some of the other tactics that we're gonna talk to. So since those aren't typically the first step taken, we're gonna use this valuable real estate at the top of the page to prompt that first step. And also by having this form directly on the page, as opposed to it being a link where you bring someone somewhere else to complete that, we're showing them how easy it is to contact us. It's just a few fields, it's right here, fill it out and we'll be in touch soon. And so this is a form that will be uh, built using a slate form so that prospects can go straight into the slate database for further nurturing. Further below the fold, we have reorganized all of that content that you saw in the screen recording into accordions. So all of the content on the page is really strong. And by establishing these sections where they can click and you know, highlight the things that they want to look at, prospects can more easily find what they're looking for quickly, which is particularly useful when we're talking about a mobile device. So it can be really hard to scroll down on the page, but when you have these accordions, you can pop things open just as you want to see them. And you also have a better idea at a first glance what information is available on this page because you have all of the headings right there. Okay, I'm going to turn it to you, Ariel. Thank you. The next step beyond these changes to the website, as Paula outlined, would be a program specific call to action. By prompting a conversion requesting information regarding a specific degree, we now have information about the prospect's interests without specifically asking them. Here is an example from another client. This form appears toward the bottom of a degree specific page. We have the call to action to download an e-brochure and below that we have specific blog posts and relevant uh, blog posts that are relevant to this audience. Some are specific to the degree while others are more general that would again appeal to the audience interested in this program. The general blog posts capture attention and build awareness of this school for prospects at the top of the funnel as they can bring in visitors who are simply interested in information and may not yet be considering this degree or specifically considering this university. The blog posts support our search engine rankings for the program and after degree and program pages blog posts drive the most amount of organic traffic to this client's website. So if a prospect fills out that form, this is the brochure, the e-brochure that they would receive. Uh, it highlights a few key aspects of how this degree can be put to use and the benefits of this particular university. So when someone fills out the form, it's downloaded immediately to their device. It's also sent to their inbox so that they can reference it later if they're not ready to review it in that moment. And this is actually the start of an email nurture campaign. We'll dive into that a little bit more um, in a few moments. And when in-person recruitment is possible, these e-brochures uh, have been printed and can be passed out in the university's office or at events. So next we have a really great example of a feature on a client's website that makes the process easier for both prospects and for the admissions team and provides an engage, engaging conversion point um, that benefits the student and again the school. So most tuition and fees pages are all about pushing out information, but there's no exchange of value there. 
So here we've created a custom tuition calculator and we are providing a tailored estimate to the prospect based on their situation and the prospect is providing us their contact info and more detail than you would receive from those simpler forms on the program and degree pages. So now we, we know more about them and again, their, their unique situation. On most inquiry forms, we do recommend minimizing the amount of information requested. You know, you want to make it simple. The fewest amount of clicks, the fewest asks is going to increase the likelihood that someone's going to complete your form. But when you have more valuable conversion point like this, where you're actually offering them information, you can get more out of them. <laughs> Prospects are gonna be more willing to give you a little bit more information about themselves because they know they're gonna receive valuable information in return. Then you can leverage this information to provide more tailored information to them via your other channels, such as email marketing or social media advertising. This aids in the decision-making for the student and it provides a way for the school to gauge and collect interest of the different programs um, that you wouldn't normally otherwise see. So this example uh, was created by our web development team. It's a form and calculator built into Slate, and then we have styled and implemented it into the client's Drupal website. In addition to the calculator on the site, uh, where people can come across it on two different tuition and financial related pages, uh, we've also, in our email and text message campaigns, added these different emails that drive users to the calculator. So again, we're at all points um, reminding people about the financial uh, support that's available. And we know now more than ever that affordability is a primary decision maker for prospective students. So bumping back up to the top of the funnel, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about video advertising, which is a powerful way to leave a lasting brand impression with your target audience. So we know that 50% of prospective online university students were significantly more likely to say they felt confident, excited, or enthusiastic after watching program specific or brand videos. Bundle that with the fact that YouTube is the second most popular search engine after Google, of course, and you've got more than enough reasons to know that potential students can be reached on YouTube. YouTube advertising is run through Google and has an abundance of targeting options that enable you to get in front of the right audience. Video advertising is most commonly used at the top of the funnel to create awareness and prompt prospects to learn more. But YouTube ads can also run on partner sites, so not just on your YouTube on your desktop, or your mobile, or even on your TV. When, they are, when the ads are shown on YouTube, um, an option is to show these companion banners. You can see an example on the desktop version on the left. Um, so in that example, in the upper right hand corner, um, there's a, a companion banner which creates an even stronger call to action and it's another opportunity for a brand impression. So now let's move on to an incredibly, another incredibly popular platform, which is Facebook. So you, most, you are most likely already using Facebook advertising, and if not, you have no doubt been told that you should be. So instead of talking about Facebook ads generally, we wanna share a specific tactic within Facebook advertising that we have found to be effective, which is leveraging Facebook's lead generation forms. So at first glance, a lead gen form ad looks like a standard Facebook ad. And so this type of advertising can show on both Facebook and it can show on Instagram. And so when you click on the call to action, which you'll see, you'll have to learn more at the bottom right of each of the ads, it brings you to a form directly on Facebook or directly on Instagram, depending on whatever platform you're on. Um, and so I'm going to go to the next slide to see that. Uh, so this, by having um, the ability to collect the inquiries directly on Facebook or, or on Instagram, we're removing the barriers to contact the school by having that conversion point right there. So they don't have to click to your website, they don't and they get distracted or worry about slow load times, or let's say you don't have as good of uh, control over your website, which is the case for some of our clients. Um, this is a really great way to create a great, easy experience for someone to contact you. So Facebook also pre-populates their 
name, their email, their phone number, so it saves the prospect time. And there's also a belief that it could even potentially improve the quality of information you're receiving because someone can't mistype their email address because it's already in there for them. And so they'd have to take that extra step to you know, replace the pre-populated data with something incorrect in order for you to end up with incorrect data. So it's a really, really neat feature in that way. Uh, there have been concerns in the marketing industry about the quality of leads from Facebook lead forms. And we do find that this can be the case in the beginning of a campaign as it takes time to analyze and make those changes. And that's really true for anything. Um, but what we see happen with um, Facebook lead forms is that they do tend to generate a large quantity of leads. And so it can feel like you're getting a lot of bad leads, but the when you look at the percentage, everything looks good. And then when you're over time, you're starting to make those tweaks and make those changes, we start to see really good feedback. So we rely on our client heavily to give us direct feedback on each lead so that we know the quality of the leads because that will allow us to tweak our campaign. And so, as I mentioned before, after that time, we, are, we do receive really great feedback from our clients that the leads are high quality. And it really all comes back to that targeting and that messaging, which is something that we expect we're going to need to tweak over time. So Facebook also responded to this concern by rolling out what they call higher intent forms. That, and it adds a couple of extra steps for the submitter when they're on a mobile device. Let's go back to the ads themselves and talk about them a little bit in more detail. So in education, we use these types of ads primarily higher in the funnel, either in brand awareness or in consideration. So we're either using them to drive prospects into the funnel or to move them down the funnel by prompting a sign up for more info about a specific feature or benefit about the, um, the program. And so uh, a little bit of insight into four pieces of the strategy behind these ads. Number one is targeting for these types of ads would typically be interest-based, meaning that we're showing our ads to creative audiences that our team hand builds that gets the message in front of new people that would potentially have an interest in a specific degree. We also leveraging some, leverage some remarketing to website visitors, but more on remarketing in our seven steps. The second thing is that ads highlight, the ads are gonna highlight features and benefits that our audience cares about, such as transfer credits, the fact that there are online classes, evening classes, and weekend classes. The third is that we're gonna showcase emotional language, like follow your passion to help uh, move someone to, uh, for the ad to really connect with them. And we use softer CTAs or uh, calls to action on these higher funnel ads, such as the learn more button. And we repeatedly see de increases in our quality of leads, quantity of leads, excuse me. So when we implement Facebook lead form ads, we're repeatedly seeing increases in quantity of leads and a decrease in the cost per inquiry after we're bringing these into the fold. So for one client, the cost per inquiry for Facebook was cut to about 40% of the cost prior to having any lead gen forms in the campaign after they were implemented. And to show the value of the time for testing and tuning for another client, the cost per inquiry decreased to about 23% of what, of what it was originally after 12 months of testing and tuning. So it can take some time and you, you know, we do have to be patient when it comes to tuning these campaigns, but over time, the more and long, you know, the longer they run, the more feedback um, and information we have, the more we can make these campaigns efficient and really super productive. So with the tactics we've discussed so far, you've established brand awareness, you've gotten their attention, and you've prompted an action. So you've collected a large list of prospects. Now what? You can't just assume that they will take the next step on their own. And you can't tell yourself they'll come to us when they're ready. It's time to move them along through the process and drive them further through their journey. And this is where email comes in. Sending a newsletter on a regular interval with latest news and happenings is not equivalent to a true nurture campaign. So what's the difference between nurture versus newsletter? Nurture is an intentional and strategic set of messages sent to a prospect over a period of time to guide them through the decision making process to an ultimate desired action. Nurture campaigns are sent to individual prospects as they take specific action that triggers the communications to get to kick off. Content is specific to that degree or their course, and it highlights the most critical decision points and calls the prospect to further action. 
Timing is based on your understanding of the prospect's journey combined with best practices. So if you're starting out, consider best practices and um, look at what resources are out there in terms of timing. And then as things go, you should tweak the timing of your email campaigns based off of the response and the action you're seeing and the life cycle of a student journey from inquiry to through enrollment. When leveraging nurture campaigns best, you'll have several population segments receiving multi-step messages with varied timing and targeted content depending on the decision cycle and decision factors for that particular program. So the newsletters, on the other, other hand, can be used with prospects to keep them brand aware, especially, especially when it comes to prompting events such as admissions webinars or other educational series that um, can add on to, again, the full admissions cycle. Um, and then also letting them know about upcoming deadlines, timely student stories, awards, new programs, um, and then newsletters can also be helpful to engage current students as well as your alumni population. So let's take a look at a sample email campaign. This nurture campaign is for a college summer program designed for high school students, and it incorporates both email and text messages. Uh, it's prompted by filling out a form on the website, or as you saw in um, the slides Paula led us through earlier, one of those lead generation forms on Facebook or Instagram. So on day one, a student would receive the digital download via email. On day five, they would receive another email with both student and parent testimonials. Uh, we've seen from this individual client that both students and parents are co-decision makers. So we wanted to be, be sure to address both of those audiences. And then on day seven, receiving a link to frequently asked questions that cover the particular differences between things such as a commuter versus a residential program. On day 11, we're prompting potential students to review course offerings so they can become more familiar with the program and decide, is this something they're interested in? And then on day 15, a text uh, promotes access to the university's research facilities, which is a major selling point for this program. Now we start getting into the messaging with stronger calls to action. On day 20, a dedicated email to start your application, and on day 25, a text that calls, act, calls attention to the application deadline. And on day 30, we have a push to apply now, which then repeats every 30 days. At the point that someone starts an application, at any point during that timeline, they actually would stop receiving this series of emails and texts and start receiving a different set of emails and texts with finish your application language and unique messaging around transcripts, letters of intent, and all the various parts of the application. Email has been a critical part of our education strategies and we continuously see high rates of engagement on the website for visitors driven by our email nurture. Visitors from email spend the longest amount of time on the site and look at the most number of pages, so we can tell that they're a highly engaged audience. This reinforces the value of engaging this audience who has opted in to hearing more from you. And finally, we get to our seventh tactic, which is remarketing. And so while this is last is certainly not least. Remarketing really is a critical tactic to help move those prospects down the funnel and nurture them to complete the next action in their journey. So remarketing and email nurture really kind of go hand in hand and play a similar role, but they're both really helpful and critical to the process. So remarketing, which you may have also heard it referred to as retargeting, means showing your message to people who have already engaged with you in some way. So most people think of remarketing as, oh, that's when Amazon follows me around with that product I was looking at. And yes, that is true. And it can be even more strategic than that. But I just love that example. So you can remarket to people who have been to your site, to certain pages on your site, who have engaged with you on social media, those who have taken a specific action, or you can even remarket to specific email addresses who, of people who have, say, started an application and haven't completed it and use that to encourage them to complete their application. So you'll see that, you know, that hand-in-hand -hand, uh, work there with that email marketing. 
So two important strategies for messaging in our remarketing include more urgent CTAs, including an apply now button. So you'll notice how we were using Facebook ads higher up in the funnel. We had softer CTAs like learn more, but now we're further into the funnel. So we're really pushing for that action to get them to apply now. And then we're using features and benefits uh, style messaging so that we could push for that consideration of the offer that we have and move them to convert. So you'll see things like launch or learn. They're a little bit more action based. So leveraging a combination of remarketing and email nurture can really help you stay top of mind for prospects after they're already in the funnel and move them through that decision making process. So it's really critical to usher them through this process. As Ariel said, you can't expect them to just come to you when they're ready. You have to be ushering them through that process so that you can move them along and also be in, uh, informing them through that process of potential barriers. And so helping remove some of those barriers. So like financial aid or having a student testimonial where you're alleviating some concern that maybe they didn't even realize that they had yet. And so email nurture and remarketing are really the key ways to do this. So you can show start your application ads to one appropriate group and you can show complete your application ads to another. You can do it in a really segmented way. Plus remarketing, we find time and time again, improves the efficiency of your campaigns, meaning it typically brings the cost of advertising down. So for one higher education client, remarketing achieved a cost per inquiry of $16 approximately versus about $42 for some compared to some of the higher funnel advertising. So you might say, okay, well, the cost is great. It's going to, you know, drive action. Why can't I just run that? Well, it's really, it's, it's part of a much larger strategy and it really won't work on its own. So it, um, as with all the tactics we talked about today, remarketing has to be run with everything else so that it can really be most effective. And so each of these seven pieces and parts that we talked about today really support each other in a full funnel cross channel campaign that get in front and get in front of prospective students with the right message at the right time in their decision making process so that you can drive them into and down the bomb. So now let's move into our takeaways and then we'll head into Q&A. So first is that well organized program and degree pages convert and inform. Program specific downloads and blogs drive interest and action. Valuable conversion points like the tuition calculator um, establish a meaningful exchange of value. Video can build a lasting brand impression. Facebook lead gen drives frictionless contact with the ads that are shown on both Facebook and on Instagram. Email nurture guides prospects down the funnel and remarketing really supports email in being that guide. All right, so now we're going to turn it over to Q&A. It's a one question that we received ahead of time in our pre webinar survey was how can we get more prospects for uh, graduate populations into the um, into the funnel. And so everything that we talked about today is really applicable to all types of programs and the targeting for your advertising is really where you get to segment down into figuring out okay how can i get graduate populations to pay attention to me and so depending on the program or the degree that you're targeting there are a lot of different ways that you can go about getting your specific audience um, so there are in-market audiences, so Facebook and Google tend to have a, an idea of how to classify people based on the fact that they're in the market for something. And then you would layer that plus other types of interests that are related to your program in order to get in front of the right people. All right, so we don't have any other open questions to answer. Uh, so I'll move on to the final slide and share my and Ariel's contact information. We really hope that you will reach out to us if you have any questions at all. Uh, just a few final housekeeping items before we shut down is to please leave us feedback. A link to a survey will pop up after we end the session. The second is that you're going to receive a recording within the next two days of the session. 
And then the final is that we're putting together a self-assessment to guide you or your team through auditing your own marketing efforts to see if you're leveraging all of these best practices that we talked about today. And we're going to be emailing that out when it's complete within the next couple of weeks. All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming today. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Ariel, for joining me as my co-presenter. Everybody have a great rest of the day.